Now, um, special thanks to Tom Warman, who made me a fresh cup of coffee. Happy Father's Day, Tom. Happy Father's Day to all the men of God here. And um, yeah, we're in a series called Church Under Fire. We're going through the book of 1 Corinthians. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians um, chapter 15. You guys, we only have three more weeks left in this book, and then we will have completed the entire book of 1 Corinthians. Um, Just so you know, we are getting ourselves ready because this fall... Yep, that's right. This fall, we're going to be going through, are you ready for this? We're going to be going through the book of Genesis, okay? It's going to take us eight months to go through the book of Genesis, and we are calling it Origin. Now, you are going to marvel at the similarities between the book of Genesis and Revelation. In fact, origin, it, it's all about the womb of all living things. It is all about this place, this Garden of Eden, this convergence point where God comes, it intersects with man and, and how man kind of screws things up like man sometimes does, okay? And and um, and you're going to see this incredible um, storyline of God's redemption and restoration that's going to begin interweaving throughout the book of Genesis. And um, you say, why are you reading the book of Genesis? Don't you know that these are the end times? Well, listen, if you want to understand the end, you're going to need to understand the beginning. And I'll tell you why. Because um, we, most of us, are Greeks, and we think in terms of timeline, where you have a beginning and you have an end. But the Hebrews, they don't think that way. They don't think in terms of lines. Beginning, they think in terms of a circle, which means that what we see as the revelation, the end, the end times, maybe, I'm just submitting to you, body of Christ, you know, maybe... Revelation is not the end. Maybe Revelation is actually the beginning. So if you want to understand the end times, you need to understand the beginning. So here's what we're going to do. Are you ready, are you ready for this? We are going to study Genesis, which is, which is actually, believe it or not, starts off as a very light, bright, amazing, beautiful book, but then it goes dark. And it gets chaotic, but God never leaves it. He always, he, he, his, 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 his blood strand it interweaves all throughout the chaos. You're going to see the presence of Jesus in, in all the drama. Okay? But then we're going to study the book of Genesis, and then guess what? After a year, we're going to go all the way to the end of the book, and we're going to do a study of the book of Revelation. So we're going to look at two weddings. Because the Bible begins with a wedding, the Bible ends with a wedding. We're going to see beauty, purity, glory, all the way to the end of the restoration of all things. Don't worry, it's only going to take a few years, but that's where we're going over the next few years. So if you're planning on being around a while, okay, if you've got a long-term eschatology, then I would invite you to join us because we're going to be diving into the Word of God and it's going to be amazing. Now... If you weren't here last week, we did Resurrection Life Part 1. And if you're part of Sierra Bible Center, then I know you, okay? I know who you are. I know that you love Jesus. I know that you love to worship. I know that you love the presence of the Lord. I know that you love God and you love people. I know that you love to worship. And when I preach, you love to listen. And you love to take notes until your hand is shaking so violently that you throw your pen, get whacked, and end up on the floor and go, (laughs) Those are the best messages. When you no longer hear me, but all you can hear is the voice of the Holy Spirit who hijacks us. So that's my prayer, is that tonight as we're diving into the Word, there's a moment of transition where you can no longer hear Darren. I become like Charlie Brown. And all you can hear is the voice of your beautiful Creator testifying of His fatherly love and affection for you. Okay. Now, 
last week we talked about this place where we love Jesus, we're doing our thing, but every now and then something happens and we get notification that somebody that we love, somebody that we're in relationship with has passed away. Now there's two things that most of us would rather not think about, taxes and death. So if there's one verse that's not studied very often, not one verse, but one passage of Scripture that's not studied very often at church because it doesn't necessarily um, promote a lot of church growth, is, is the text on death and life that's found right here in what we're, not only are we talking about it, we're spreading it out over two weeks to talk about what happens when we sleep. Now, I didn't say die because if you're a believer... One of the things that we looked at last week is that, honey, you'll never die. And now some of you are going to say, whoa, 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 what? 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 I never, I never die. What? Never die. What kind of weird, what kind of weird cult is it? Yeah. You see, the problem we have in America is the same problem that the church was having in Corinth. And that is that they did not subscribe to what Paul calls the gospel of the resurrection. In fact, last week we looked at Paul said that if you don't subscribe to the gospel of the resurrection, then you are lacking in the fullness of your salvation. Now, something like this is so radically important, then why is it that most of us have never even heard of the gospel of the resurrection? The truth is, is that we're good, we're Christian, we're moral, we're responsible, and some of us even recycle Okay, that would be your blue bin. Okay, some of you even vote Republican. Some of you like do these different kinds of things. You know, like, like you're doing your best. But what happens is, is that when somebody in our life passes away, and all of a sudden we have to go to what's called a celebration of life service or a funeral or a memorial. Now, um, I don't know about you, but um, uh, I've been to a lot of celebration of life services. And what I find is that there is an awkwardness in that. Because if you were to celebrate my life, you're like, hey, Pastor Darren, I want to invite you over to my house. Why? Because we want to celebrate your life. Now, if I came to your house and I walked in, you had a slideshow going of the day I was born all the way up to the present. And everybody at my celebration was wearing all black and wearing sunglasses. And all the ladies and some of the weird guys had mascara running down their face. I'd be like... What are we doing here? Pastor Darren, we're here to celebrate your life. This doesn't feel like a celebration at all. We know, you know, there is a tension because we kind of know theologically that we should celebrate when a believer passes away, but we don't. Why? Because if we're honest, there's a part of us where we feel violated. There's a tension with death. There's this tension where we know that someone has gone to heaven and yet we feel like somebody has just broke into our home and stolen something and someone precious to us. In fact, if I was honest, I would tell you that, that there, there have been very few celebrations of life where to me, I actually felt like partying. Yeah. And why is that? It's because death is an imposter. Death is not our friend. Death is not a part of the original storyline of Jesus for humanity. In the beginning, God created everything. It was pure. It was good. It was fruitful. It was bountiful. It was prosperous. And there was no death. So when we're told that we are to celebrate the death or the loss of someone, it feels awkward. Am I wrong? And that is because... We don't really have a comprehensive theology for the gospel of the resurrection. And this is what we're working on. And this is what we started working on last week. And guys, this week, we're going to talk about what happens when you sleep. What happens, and and I'm praying that that, that as I'm speaking, because Holy Spirit is all up in this crib here tonight. Holy Spirit's all up in this joint. And I'm praying that as, as, we're, as we're studying this thing, that Holy Spirit begins to pop some revelation inside of us so that as we're studying it, we will see that even though we walk in the valley of the shadow of death, that that's as close to death as we will ever get. 
Because death surely has been swallowed up. Now, we're going to read a bunch of verses. For, for those of you that don't really have a habit of reading your Bible, we're going to read so many verses tonight. It's going to, it, we're going to make up for all the devotions that you didn't even have this year. You know, so we're going to read a lot of our Bible tonight. And then when we're done with the text, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a mad pivot on you. I'm going to jump to the book of Romans. And then we're going to dive into this radical, radical tension where we live as the body of Christ. And then I'm going to holler at you in love. And I'm going to charge you. And I'm going to edify you. And I'm going to build you up so that when we leave this place, we no longer fear death. You might still fear taxes, but at least when you fear this place, you will no longer fear death, and you will be unquestionably a friend of life. That's where we're going right here, right now at SRC. Are you guys ready? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you there? Verse 35. Here we go. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? This is what we're talking about tonight. Some of you will ask, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? Now, this is Paul talking to the Corinthians. You know, the pastor Darren would never talk to all y'all this way. But this is him. Okay, so we're just going to bear with Paul. You know, sometimes he gets a little bit um, uh, hot-headed. And he, so he says to the Corinthians, you foolish fools. Okay? What you sow does not come back to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that it is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen into each kind of seed its own body. What is this? This is a metaphor. He says, if you're going to understand death and resurrection, if you're going to understand what happens, um, after, uh, after we die, then he uses the metaphor. You're going to have to look at a seed being buried into the ground. The seed, it seems to die as it certainly begins to decompose. Yet on that very spot, new life begins to emerge. Totally different in appearance from the seed. And yet somehow a mature plant remains the same living entity and DNA. Paul says that you look at a seed, you, and unless it goes into the ground, you will not see its beauty and its full potential. That means that for the believer, when the world said, it's, it's done, ah, you're expired, rest in peace. The world says, oh, he was a good man. But the gospel says, no, 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 that man has just begun. You knew the seed form, but now from that seed is going to come something far more beautiful, far more glorious. That brother is not dead. He's asleep and he's about to be awakened into a brand new reality, into a brand new physical, beautiful glory. Yep, true story. I'm just going to have a little sip of coffee as you just kind of marinate in that revelation. Now that there is some bold Sumatra. Here we go. Verse 39. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one kind and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for stars differ from a uh, uh, for star differs from star in its glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. Everybody say perishable. But what is raised is imperishable. Say imperishable. What is sown in dishonor, okay, goes down in dishonor, but it comes up in glory. What is sown in weakness is raised in power. What is sown in a natural body is raised in a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. For the believer, what goes down must come up. 
You and I are in need of a body that is built for eternity. Have you guys thought about eternity? Have you thought about your new glorified body? You know, the truth is, is that, you know, we're Christians, so we don't use our imagination. That's just for new agers. Amen? But it is time for us to begin thinking and dreaming about going down and then coming up and coming alive and thinking about our new imperishable glorified body. I am telling you, the Father has designed a body for Darren that is built for eternity. This is what we're talking about, you guys. We're talking about the earth says you live and you die, but the gospel says you live and then you really live. Verse 45, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit, referring to Jesus, amen? Verse 46, but it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven, as was the man of dust. So also are those who are of the dust, okay? And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have been born, the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Two Adams. The first Adam was placed in a garden and was placed there with two trees. A test. And that first Adam was tested and failed and sentenced with death. Then Jesus, the true and perfect second Adam, was tested in the same way and passed every test so that we in him, when we fail, can reap the benefits of Jesus and the results of his test. The first Adam came and failed. The second Adam, Jesus, in the same way was tested, just in the same way that we were tested, Okay, both men, Adam was a man of dust, created from the dust, right? But then Jesus, the living God, this blows my mind. Jesus, the son of the living God, he came from heaven to earth to show. <laughs> from the earth to the cross, from the cross. You know. Remember, yeah. <laughs> Lord, I lived in <laughs> Yeah. Check it. He came from heaven to come as a dust man. He came from heaven and submitted to the governing order of the earth and likewise laid his divinity aside and came to be wrapped in dust. But... Unlike Adam, his character and nature changed at the cross. You see, Adam failed and therefore reaped the benefits of his failure, okay? But Jesus resurrected in his perfection, and after doing so, he came back. And when he came back, the bro was no longer wrapped in dust, he now came out of the tomb with a glorified physical body. Absolutely stinking, at, at outstanding. Okay, verse, verse 50. I tell you this, brothers. Okay, check it out. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, Darren, you said that the physical wasn't bad. Darren, last week you said that we, our glorified bodies would be physical. Darren, you said that heaven was physical, but now it says Paul's contradict. Darren, 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 what's up? Why are you contradicting? It said, Darren, the word of God says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. Yeah, no, this Paul's not contradicting himself. 
We see that Jesus did have a resurrected physical body, but what we see here, flesh and blood, is a term referring to the corruptible mortality. That our corrupted mortality cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Therefore, what do we need? We need the resurrection power of Christ Okay, to deal with and to transform our mortality into immortality. So our, mor our mortal self needs to be resurrected and transformed. And this is what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about the resurrection and the transformation of your body post-sleep. Verse 51 Behold, I tell you a mystery. Why is this a mystery? Because it's shrouded in mystery. I don't know about you. We're going to study this for two weeks, but I'm going to still have a lot of questions. How about you? How many of you already, your heart's filled with a lot of questions? Guess what? We're, we're not going to have answers for all the questions. But guess where I can point you? To Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and and the life, and he can give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. So listen, I've given up my right to have to understand everything. And we need, as the body of Christ, we need to start being friends of mystery. Because I know Christians that think they know it all. I don't like to hang out with them. So it says in verse 51, <laughs> I was like, no, nah, you're wrong, but I'm not going to tell you because you couldn't handle, you can't handle the truth. All right, so verse 51, behold, <laughs> I tell you a mystery, I, and I, I stink and love this, we shall not all sleep. What does that mean? Okay, well, I'll just keep reading. But we shall all be, read it with me, church. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That means that not all of us will need to be resurrected, but all of us will need to be transformed. How long does this transformation take? Well, let's take a look. It takes just a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will set, church, there will be a generation that does not taste death. In the twinkling of an eye, they shall hear the last trumpet, and the dead will be raised, and the imp raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put Put on zip our immortality. Not all will sleep. Christ is coming back. A generation will escape sleep. But either way, whether you taste of sleep or you get to experience the second coming of Christ, we will all still need to be transformed into our new, heavenly, glorified, restored, eternal, glorified bodies. I am... Um, I have a lot of comic books. It's true. And, um, and I like comic book movies. And one of the things that I like is I like it when, when there's a really bad villain, okay? And so-and-so comes up to the hero and says, well, we've made some modifications to your suit and we've got you a new suit. I love it when a hero gets a new suit. Why? Because you remember what the old suit could do. Just webs. But you, when Iron Man gets the new suit, it's like he's putting on a James Bond car. Jarvis, pops. And that's what we're kind of talking about tonight. When, verse 54, when the perishable puts on the imperishable. 
When you upgrade your earth suit to your eternal suit. When the mortal puts on immortality. Brother, this is your Bible. You're reading, this isn't a comic book. This is in your Bible. These are the kinds of verses that we should read. When you zip up your immortality suit, okay, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up. This is interesting. Death is swallowed up in what? Victory. Victory. If somebody's going to be victorious, that means that if, if there's a party that's victorious, that means that there's another party that's if there's one party that's victorious, there's another party that's, that's a loser, that's defeated. But this is mean. You know, how to, at the end, you know, at the end of like a, of a game, you played a good game, right? And there's a winner and there's a loser. And, and what, what do you do? You go up to the, the loser and you say, good game, good game, good game. But what does the believer do to death? The believer comes up. To the muzzled monster. <laughs> and Paul confronts it. He taunts it. He taunts death. And what does he say? Oh death, where is your victory? He taunts death and says, oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, if you're a believer, death cannot touch you. Death is muzzled. It will try to intimidate you. It'll try to freak you out. But if you are a believer, Jesus died so that you don't have to. He died so that you can sleep. He in his perfection died so that you in your imperfection just have to take a little nap. And when you wake up from your nap, you will be upgraded. <sighs> just to clear, I'm not going to die. I'm going to take a nap. And when I wake up, I'll be upgraded. Check it out. Verse 58. Therefore, everyone say therefore. My beloved brothers, be steadfast, be immovable, be unshakable. Have your feet shot up with the preparation of the gospel of feet of peace. Get, get battle ready. You shouldn't be tripping. You shouldn't be falling. You shouldn't be on the ground. Say, ah, I'm falling. Oh, you shouldn't be afraid of death. Death is covered. I'm getting old. I'm underneath this system of decay. I'm a slave. I'm a prisoner to this realm. Ah. Ah, uh, no, eat, drink, be merry for tomorrow. Just be, well, just be unwise. It's okay. Well, you're just dying and this whole thing. It's, it's done. No, honey, you're going to be around a while. And if you are a believer, this earth is the closest thing to hell you will ever see. Paul says, in light of this good and glorious gospel of the resurrection, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So this is the promise for the believer. And he, uh, here's the thing. I'm planning on being around a while. How about you? You guys, we have got to untether from this expectancy of decay and from this place of honoring death. I never want to honor death. I want to honor you, but I always want to honor you as an ever living one. And that's in 2016, my dad went to sleep. But guess what? He's very awake. 
It's Father's Day. I can honor my dad. I, 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 here, here's the thing. I, I just a, a good friend of mine. His mom uh, passed away, and she was praying for a lot of things. And and he was just telling me this morning. You know, she just passed away this last week. And you want to know what he told me? He said, "I know this sounds weird." He said, "But my, my mom was praying for a lot of things, and then this last week she passed. She passed away. And all of a sudden, all her prayers started getting answered." Why? Because now she's not just praying. She's participating with the great cloud of witnesses. No, 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 no. You'll walk in the shadow of death, but you won't taste it. You will walk in the shadow of death, but you won't taste it. This is why Paul said, he said uh, to his persecutors, hey, what are you going to do? Kill me? <laughs> I'm already dead. It's time for you and I to be a little more bold. Paul says, you're not going to be immovable. You're not going to be unshakable if you're afraid of death. If you're afraid of the muzzled monster that wants to intimidate you. A muzzled monster. Where's your sting? You're the defeated foe. Christ Jesus crushed you under his feet. Now the tension. We're going to pivot. I'm going to take you to Romans chapter 8. And Glenn, I'm going to do this out of the Passion Translation. So this is Romans 8, verse 18 to 25. This is where we're going to read about the present state of the earth and all of creation and looking at the finished work of the cross and its, um, and its transformative, redemptive process within the present, but this place where we have not yet seen the restoration of all things, okay? And yet the record of restoration is existent and embedded in all living things, and all living things are testifying of the record of eternity and longing for its restoration and for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God that will initiate the next paradigm, that will initiate the next Eden. Okay, so we see here, Romans chapter 8, verse 18, for I am convinced that any suffering that we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. The entire universe is standing on on tiptoe. This is what the universe is like right now. All the cosmos yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. That all of created order, that the cosmos, that Saturn, the Milky Way, the wormholes, wah, 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 the black holes, <laughs> like the it's like it's big, okay? Like I, <laughs> the universe is massive. And this is what the Word of God says, that all of the universe is like... In, in an extreme tension that all the cosmos is like, is it time yet? I can't handle it. The universe is stressed out, man. And guess what? There's, there's no Prozac for the universe. Like, it's just like, it's just fast. So the universe has a crazy migraine because it's waiting for the revealing of who? Of you. Me? 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 That's what my Bible says. For against its will. Check it out. It's so fascinating to speak of the cosmos, the heavens in this way. For against its will, the universe itself had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. How many of you... Um, you had a family member, and they made an unwise choice, and it impacted you. How many of you, you had a family member, and they made an unwise choice, and it even affected your health? Wait a minute. You know what Paul says here? The first sin, the first sin of Adam, 
it created ripples that went out even into the cosmos. And it says the universe against its will is living in this radical tension that was created and caused by humans' rebellion against the Father. That the decision that our first father and mother made to rebel against God created a radical fracturing in the cosmos. That all created things have the embedded testimony of this is not the way things ought to be. Somewhere in Renton, Washington this last week at a bar Two guys were drinking Paps Blue Ribbon, and there was on the screen CNN, and one man looked over at the other man and said, bro, this sucks. And the other dude said, yep. At which point the first man said, yeah, bro, this is not the way it ought to be. At which point the other man said, yeah. Goop, 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 goop. And somewhere in the cosmos, one planet is saying to the other, ah! the way it ought to be. Humanity, wake up! For against its will, the entire universe itself had to endure empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. But now, with eager expectation, all of creation longs for freedom from slavery to decay and to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. To this day, we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creation as if it were in contractions. Just breathe through it, baby. <sighs> breathe through it, baby. You're going to make it. <sighs> I'm trying. I'm trying. Just breathe, baby. Breathe. <sighs> The contractions of labor for childbirth. And this is what's happening in creation. And not just creation, but we who have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit also groan inwardly as we passionately long to experience our full status. Everybody say full status. Everyone declare there's more. Declare there's more. Say it out loud. There's more. Full status. Full status. Full status. There's more. There's more. There's more. There's more. There's more. To experience our full status as God's sons and daughters. Check it out. Including our physical bodies being transformed. There it is. For this is the hope of our salvation. What's the hope of our salvation? This great awakening to who we are, to whose we are, and the transformation of our bodies into our new eternal suits. This is the hope of our salvation. But hope means that we must trust and wait for what is still unseen. I'm going to read that again. But hope means that we must trust and wait for that which is still unseen. For why would we need to hope for something if we already have it? So because our hope is set on what is yet to be seen, we patiently keep on waiting for its 
fulfillment. All of creation is groaning and waiting. The molecules in your skin are saying, this is not the way it ought to be. Your, your face, skin, as it is like, enough of the gravity already, right? Like, it's saying, this is not the way it ought to be. That the grass, the sun, the moon, and the stars, they're not just sitting out there like, yeah, bro, that's, whoa, isn't it awesome? But there's life of everything, where everything, everything is in one, and one is everything, and if everything, we are the cosmos, and they're just, no, that's New Age hogwash. All creation is groaning and waiting, saying, we know the way that God, we have the record of beauty, we have the record of eternity, we have the record of glory, and it is embedded in every created thing, and we know that there is so much more that we don't yet see. And this is why when you go to a funeral, this is why when you know somebody and, and, and their own cells are rebelling against themselves, and, and, and this is when, when, we, when, we, when we see these things that are not right, what is that? That is the record of injustice. That is the record of decay. That is the record of death. And it is in that tension, it is in this place that there is the, the past, Okay? But then there is Jesus who came, lived, died, and resurrected. Then there is us, right here in the present, 2021, and the, and the age of the ecclesia, the called out ones that have been commissioned and infilled with the spirit of Christ Jesus himself to do what? To go into good news everything. That's your job, by the way. That's your job description, by the way. That's our glorious mission, is to go everywhere in good news everything. And to good news it, good news it, good news it, good news it, until it begins to transform and transfigure into the glory and perfection of Christ Jesus. The good news of the gospel of the resurrection transforms and transfigures everything. And as you begin to good news something, all, all, all of a sudden, as you begin to testify of the resurrection power of Christ Jesus, you begin to prophesy because the testimony of Christ Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And as you prophesy, a portal opens and the place of the unseen, the realm of the restoration of all things, begins to show up into the present. And this is what we're called to do. We're not called to look at the city of Seattle and say, this is not the way it ought to be. It really, really sucks. Let's bunker down and wait for the rapture. Don't worry, Jesus is going to destroy that entire city. Thank God we won't be here. We can get raptured off this hell rock. Jesus, get me off this hell rock. And then just kill everything. That is not, and we've been left behind. I wish we all been ready. That is not the gospel. The gospel is for God so loved the entire world, the world and her perversion, the world and her depravity. For God so loved the broken, the fallen, the poor, the widows, the orphans, those, you know, for God so loved the entire broke, broken, fractured, all of this, that he sent his only begotten son who lived, died, resurrected, and ascended, and is now revealing his new glorified, revealed sons. I am telling you, there is an awakening. It's an awakening of the manifested sons and daughters of God who are going to execute justice on the earth, who with the spirit and the testimony of Christ Jesus are going to release a record of prophecy, and we will be a greater things generation that sees impossibilities bow down before for the authority of Christ Jesus. I'm telling you that Jesus in his pre-glorified body did what? Walked on water. Amen. Jesus in his post-resurrected post body walked through walls. That physical realities will bow down to the ultimate spiritual reality that is the age to come. It's physical. It's real. And the earth is in need of some people that do not fear death. You so brave. You so fearless. You so I how do you how do you do? I would never want to. I would never. Listen, you guys. 
It's time for the body of Christ to put our cup on and to get back into the game. It's time for the body of Christ to stop thinking that paid ministers are going to change the world. No, we're not. The bride of Christ is going to usher in the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the bride says, even now, so come Lord Jesus. So when you're struggling because somebody is perishing, their own physical mortal bodies are perishing, and you're commanding life, and you're doing all this, and you say, I don't understand. I don't have a theology for it. Yes, you do. You have a theology that, 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 that tells you that you are in the place of things hoped for and not yet seen. You are in the age and the era of the groaning and the travailing and the waiting for the restoration of all things. And we have to be okay to live in this tension and to not come up with a theology that says there is no supernatural because of the disappointments I've faced in my past. We are not going to define what God is capable of doing or what God is willing to do based off of what we have seen in the past. I am not going to allow my past to dictate to me who my God is. What, what's going to frame out my theology? The future, my eschatology will be framed out by the word of God that says this. People, places, things, all nouns, all created things will be restored to their original glory. I want you to look at your hands. Declare these hands. These hands will not perish. I will have everlasting life. And life abundantly. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What does that mean? The thief comes to steal from you physically. He comes to attack your psychology. He comes to attack your spirituality. He comes to convince us that because of our sin, because of our past, that we are disconnected from the presence of God, but the enemy is a big, fat, talking head. The enemy is just a snake, and a snake is just a talking head. This is all the enemy can do. All the enemy can do is lie to you. And I would say this. I don't, I don't know how you feel tonight, but this is what I know. You are not separated from his glory, from his presence. Every veil has been torn. The king of glory has a throne inside of your heart. And it's time for you to say, feelings, soul, you bow to the truth of God's word that says, I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, make your home in me. I'm going to host the presence of Jesus in my heart. I'm going to host the presence of Jesus in my home. I'm going to host the presence of Jesus in my career. I'm going to host the presence of Jesus in my soul. And when I am confronted by the injustice that is here and now in the present, when everybody is saying this is not the way it ought to be, we will say, you're right. This is not the way it ought to be. Therefore, I'm going to do something. Who's going to do something? I'll tell you this. The only people that are going to do something about the injustice are people that do not fear death. Because when I watch the superhero movies, I see these big, bad, creepy things that are larger than a city. And then I see a hero that flies up into the chaos. It's every superhero movie. Ah, we're all going to die. Nope, I'm willing to die to save the city because I know I can't die. I'm telling you, your favorite song, church, should be down, 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 can't touch this. Down, 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 down. Down, 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 down. Can't touch this. Death, where's your sting? You have no hold on me. Chris, you know I can't. Now let's talk for a second. When you die, you're going to get a physical glorified body. Okay? It's going to be different because it's not going to be dust. But it'll be physical. Thomas got to fill the wounds on Jesus. Okay? 
when you see me, some of you guys are going are gonna to know me when I'm in my 120s. I'm telling you, when I'm in my 120s, I'm going to be pretty fly for a white guy. Just so you know, I'm planning on being around for a while. I'm engaging in spirit. I take communion, but I also probably take more vitamins than anyone here. I, I got a supplement for everything. It is redonkulous. It is like, phew. you should see my pee in the mornings. I, <laughs> it's the Sunday night. I, it's the six o'clock. I feel, I feel comfortable with you guys. <laughs> Looks like stinking gator. Who's that? <laughs> For those of, the, of you that know me, my old age, I'm 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 gonna be I'm gonna be rocking. I'm gonna be rolling. I'm gonna be old and weird, but I'm just gonna be like, yeah. I'm gonna be bumming out the the next generation that's trying to lead the church and be like, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Ha! You know, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have the sickest bass boat. It's gonna be ridiculous. I. I, I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking forward to old age. But I'll, I'll tell you this: that there's going to time when you see me there, when I've taken off my mortality suit and put on my immortality suit. And guess what? There's going to time that I see you there. And when I see you, it's not going to be according to the flesh. It's going to be according to the spirit. When I see you there, I will be fully known, even as I am fully known you will you will fully know even as you are fully known and we won't see each other outside of the blood of Jesus because whenever we see somebody outside of the blood of Jesus we're just seeing a lie there won't be any corruption in our cells there won't be any back pain in the morning there won't be any stiffness there'll just be the song of the Lord that's on our lips and we'll still get to function according to our eternal call and our eternal scroll. That's not going to change. The assignments will be different. You're going to be on heavenly cosmic assignments. You're going to get to rule and reign with King Jesus. You're going to get to judge nations and even angels. There's going to come a time when we're greeted by our family members who are waiting for us who are praying for us. We're going to get to meet people that we never even knew, but they loved us and they prayed for us and they prayed us through tragedies and through obstacles. And we're going to say, I never even knew you. And they said, yeah, but I, I've been praying for you. We're going to get to meet Abraham, the friend of God, who is accredited to him as righteousness. We're going to get to meet Jacob. We're going to get to meet King David. We're going to get to meet Paul the Apostle. We're going to get to meet the believers that were in Corinth. We're going to get to meet Nelson Mandela. We're going to get to meet the Dr. Martin Luther King. And we won't be dead will be very, very alive. But we're also going to get to meet Jesus. How tall do you think he'll be? I think I'm going to be just slightly taller than Jesus. He was a Jewish man for a century. I'm putting him at like 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, I want to put my foot right by his foot. I want to hang out with Jesus really late. I want to hang out with Jesus like way past my bedtime. Maybe at like a fire. I 
I wonder if, I wonder if it's hard to make him laugh. I don't think it will be. I think, I think he's going to find me absolutely hilarious. And I think I'm going to find him absolutely hilarious. I want to laugh with him till I'm crying. And I want to cry with him till I'm laughing. It's crazy to think that I'm created in the image and likeness of my dad, Daryl Stott, and the image and likeness of my mom, Debbie. But I know that when I see his eyes, I'm going to know that I'm from him. That I'm his seed. That I'm his offspring. To think that generations and nations will get to look into the eyes of Jesus and see themselves. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to wait till I'm dead to have that encounter. Because I know that if I can see him now, I can be like him. I really want my Christianity to be a lot less religious. And I really want for my Christianity to flow from my relationship that I have with Jesus. I want to be able to say, oh yeah, Jesus, I know him. I know him. And he, he really likes me a lot. I want to be like him. I want to be like him so much that when people are like, Pastor, do you want to hang out with you? I feel like I'm hanging out with Jesus. You want to know something? Jesus is the least religious guy you'll ever meet. Jesus was always offending all the religious cats. I don't even think Jesus is really all that churchy. And at the end of the day, I don't want Seattle Revival Center to just be a Seattle Revival Center. I want Seattle Revival Center to be a family where we, we know Jesus. We've encountered Jesus. Like we really know him. Like he speaks to us. Like he shows himself to us. Remember we looked at Paul last week where he said all these cats, they lived with him, but I never got to live with him. But just like them, I encountered Jesus. Paul put himself in the same category as all the other apostles. But he, he met the revelation of the resurrect. I want to know Jesus the same way that Paul knew Jesus. They, like, oh no, Paul, you didn't know him the way that Peter knew him. Paul's like, yeah. Yeah, I did. Did you know that you can know Jesus in the same way that John the Beloved knew Jesus? What did John want to do? He just wanted to lay his head on his chest and hear his heartbeat. Well, I want to do that too. And what happened when John laid his head on the heartbeat of Jesus? It changed everything. It's interesting to me that John's the one apostle that they never knew what happened to him. Apparently the guy never died. That's resurrection life. Jesus is alive. And if you believe in him, you will never die. But you will have everlasting, abundant life. It's stinking cool, man. That is like the best news. I might feel the effects of decay, but that decay can never permeate my spirit. I'm a new creation reality, and I have a glorified body waiting for me. Look at the person next to you and say, you're going to be around a while. How many of you have ever heard this statement? If you're too heavenly minded, you won't be any earthly good. That's a bunch of rubbish. That, that's, that's, completely, that's completely false. 
Why? Because if you want to be earthly good, you better be heavenly minded. Why? Because earthly programming is not going to restore the earth. Heavenly programming is going to restore the earth. Set our minds on things above. Set your affections on things above. Engage with things above. Tether with things above. Interact with the things that are good, that are noble, that are virtuous. Cast down all vain imagination. Turn off the news. Turn off the media. Get off a of social. Un untether, 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 untether. Let us be a generation that is so heavenly minded that we become earthly good. Let us be a church that is so heaven, the angels of God are here tonight, that we would be so heavenly minded that we would be earthly good. That we would be so obsessed with Jesus that we would be effective with humanity. That we would be so intoxicated by his love and his grace that we would actually have the capacity of love to be able to serve the need that exists within our culture. Give to him your fishes and your loaves and he will feed the multitudes through your surrender. How many of you, that's your desire? Lord, fill me up occupy me. I surrender this physical temple to be a habitat for your glory and your holiness. Come and occupy me. Come and possess me. Come and fill my mind. Come and inhabit my dreams. I surrender it all. Hijack these lips. Take these faculties. Take these fingers and reveal yourself glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill towards all men. We surrender. We surrender. We surrender. Not our good ideas, God, but your glorious, beautiful ideas. We declare we will fear no evil for you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. We will fear no evil. Let's stand together. If we're going to be a church under fire, and by the way, we better get used to it. If we're going to be a church under fire, then we better get to know the man of fire, the burning one, the ancient of days, the great I am, Jesus the Christ. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today, you say, Pastor Darren, I don't know this Jesus. I know religion. I know rules. I know regulation. I do not know the Son of Man. Pastor Darren, I do fear death. I do fear not knowing. I, I, I haven't been taught this before. I've, I've, I've just lived in light of the past and the present, but I just, I've preferred not to think about the future because I haven't had the answers. But if you're here tonight, say, Pastor Darren, I want to know this Jesus. I want to know this son. I want to be connected. I want to know the father. I want to access my father through the son. Then I just want you to pray with me. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life. That whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you're a whosoever, and so am I. That if you believe in your heart and if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, he will be faithful and just to save you from all your sins. So without anyone looking around, let's all pray together. Just pray with me right now. Just say, Jesus, I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. Father God, I need you as a father this Father's Day. I need your advice. I need your wisdom. I need your input. I invite your revelation into my life. I give you all the record of my sins and I accept the perfect record of your son. I declare I am no longer a sinner. I am a saint. 
because of the blood of Jesus. Without anyone looking around, if you prayed that prayer tonight, would you just lift up your hand and wave it at me? You say that, Darren, tonight I prayed that prayer and I believe I am stepping into this new, awesome, God bless you, 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 God bless you. Now let me just declare of you, the record of your sin no longer has dominion over you. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are no longer underneath the jurisdiction of decay and death. You are a son. You are a daughter. Now let's just all lift up our hands. Father, I pray that you just bring us into a new season of encounters. Encounters with Jesus. I pray, hey, that even in our dreams, that we would dream of Jesus. That we would dream of heaven. That we would dream of the angels. That we would dream of the age that is to come. I pray, Lord, that that realm would begin to open up. I pray even for our children. That our children would begin to have encounters with Jesus. That in the same way that as I was a child, I had an encounter with Jesus. Lord, I pray that for my children. I pray that for every child here. I pray for dreams and visions for our grandparents. Lord, I pray that that revelatory realm would begin to open up in this hour and in this day. Lord, I thank you for this company of people. And Lord, I pray that that thin veil that seemed to separate us from the Lord, Lord, that you would remove that thin veil that we're, we're yeah, 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 yeah. And that we would begin to experience the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, come. Come tonight. Come into our bedrooms. Come into our car. Come into our marriage. Come into our home. Come into our depression. Come into our pain. Come into our sickness. Come into our disease. Come into every closet. Any closet where there's sin and secrets and skeletons. Jesus, come. Jesus, come. Jesus, come. Jesus, come. Jesus, come. Jesus, come. And bring your life. And bring your light. Lord, I pray, Lord, Lord, that even areas where there's generational oppression and generational strongholds, Jesus, that you would come tonight. Jesus, that you would come tonight and that you would break every chain, that you would break the chains, even going back to our first father, Adam, and we declare that we are stepping into the image and likeness of the second Adam, the true and perfect Adam, our risen Lord, our resurrected Christ. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that Seattle is about to be transformed because of the glory of God at work through a covenant people, a people that love God, a people that love people. We declare Seattle as a city of hope. We declare that all creation is groaning and waiting, waiting in a place of eager anticipation and expectation. And we prophesy over the body of Christ in Seattle, Washington. And we say, now is the time to arise and shine and give glory to God. We declare we will not fear any evil. We will not fear any principality. We declare that even the spirit behind that opioid addiction is going to be broken and shattered over Seattle, Washington and over Portland, Oregon. We declare it's time for harvest. And Father, we pray that you would awaken the harvesters in this time. Lord, we thank you, Father, for the portals that are opening, where the future restoration of all things begins to step into the present. Lord, we thank you for unprecedented signs, wonders, miracles, salvations, and deliverance, even the resurrection of the dead. We pray, Lord, that your resurrection power will begin to come forth from the body of Christ in this hour. Lord, we pray that we would stand strong, that we would stand tall, that we would be a voice for the voiceless, Lord, that we would be a father to the fatherless. And we pray, oh God, we seek your peace for this great region. And Lord, we pray that we would be a people of revelation. And I prophesy tonight that we are in a revelation revolution. And we will not allow for this revelation revolution to pass us by. We say we will be a people of revelation, sons and daughters of revelation who do not rule according to the order of cosmic wisdom. Wisdom that flows from the place of created things in the natural order of things. We will be a people that rule from the place of heavenly wisdom, operating from the mind of Christ. And we thank you that even in this place, people are upgrading all through this room. 
that all through this room right now, people are upgrading. That all through this room, we are taking off the government of mortality and decay that has tried to rule over us. And we are pulling that down and we are stepping into the government of his immortality, stepping into the government of his life, stepping into the government and into the order of the imperishable. And we declare there will be justice in this land. And it will be executed by the Sadiq. We declare we are of the priestly order of Melchizedek. A company of kings and priests. Radical, freaky, deaky, supernaturalist. A greater things generation. With fire in our eyes. With a sword coming from our lips. Not afraid to stand up for that which is right. In Jesus' name, all God's people said... you need prayer for anything we'd love to pray for you we'd love to stand for you listen jesus is here tonight if you're discouraged tonight if you need just a father to stand with you if you need just a mother to stand with you we would love to do that tonight i'm so stinking proud of you guys it is so cool to be in this with you and i'm telling you you should you should mark tonight on your calendar go out a year from now go to father's day 2022 and just put something on your phone, Father's Day 2022, and just, and just put, what has Jesus done in the last 12 months? Because for some of you, Jesus is going to do more in the next 12 months than he's done in the last 12 years. Seriously, go, go and do it. Put, it. put it on your calendar, Father's Day 2022. I hear Jesus saying, I want you to watch and see what I can do. I, I got a word like this for a, for a church in Redmond, Oregon. I said, I want you to put it on your calendar. I think it was 90 days, Valentine's Day. So when you put it on the calendar, because you're not even going to recognize yourself. And in the next 90 days, that church radically transformed. Radically. Right now, it, it's now a revival center in their region. I'm feeling that tonight. I'm feeling that. What does faith do? You know what faith does? It doesn't debate stuff. Faith takes it in the spirit. And if nothing else, even if you don't want to take this for yourself, I want you to, I want you to write down your calendar. I want you to look at who Darren Stott is on Father's Day 2022. I don't think you're going to recognize me. I don't think I'm going to recognize you. You want to know why? We're not going to be in the same glory. We're not going to be in the same glory. We will have gone from glory to glory. You with me? You with me? Do I got somebody I can partner with in this? Is that your expectation, Ricky? You're going from this glory to... Listen, I'm not open to any lateral transitions right now. I'm only into promotion right now. And I can tell you, I'm going up and I'll take you with me. And if you go up, you better take me with you because we're a tribe. We're a family. We're in this together. I need you to succeed. I need you to go up. You need me to come up. We're going to go up together. We're going to give glory to God. I'm not in this to maintain anything. I have no interest to maintain Seattle Bible Center. I'm not a maintenance man. I'm a builder. I'm a kingdom guy. What, what, Darren, what are, you, what are you talking about? Let's go off the air. I want to take over everything. For the glory of God. I want studios and gas stations. I want housing. We're, this is the kingdom of God. I want you to eat at my restaurants and I'll, get, I'll go to your gas stations. It's time for the kingdom of God to stop thinking like little local church and to start thinking about who our daddy is. Listen, you're not going to do this stuff if you fear death. If you fear coronavirus. We gotta be a generation that walks right into the right in John G. Lake took the bubonic plague into his hand, and under a microscope, the scientists watched as the bubonic plague died in his hand because of the glory of God. Because of a man that did not fear death and was engaging with the glory of God. Come on, guys. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. 
All right, get out of here. Go. <laughs> Yeah.